Republican Corey Mills is one of the nearly 80 new U.S. House members in the 118th Congress and one of nearly 100 veterans currently serving on Capitol Hill. The Bronze Star recipient told C-SPAN about how his military service prepared him for Congress and influenced his views on our Constitution and about his childhood in Central Florida. So I was actually born in Winter Haven, Florida, but I grew up in a really tiny town called Auburndale, which is not so small now. So uh, real small town, grew up with my grandparents. Um, my mom and dad, like many families in Central Florida, had issues with substance and drug abuse. And so uh, both of them were in and out of prison for a lot of my life. And so I was adopted by my grandparents and raised and, you know, kind of grew to appreciate that small town feel, but also that nuclear family. Describe your childhood. So, you know, my childhood, you know, in the very beginning was sometimes uh, difficult. Um, you know, bouncing house to house, not having your parents there at all times, kind of being pawned off on friends or relatives. And, you know, it was really my grandparents who kind of was a real blessing. I mean, they stepped in and said, you know, he needs stability. He needs a, uh, a solid home. And that's when they chose to take me in and adopt me. They took me for a summer originally and uh, really enjoyed it and, you know, grew up learning how to hunt and fish and live off the land and, you know, just a very traditional kind of central Florida southern family. How do you think that shaped you? Well, I think that, you know, when you experience these types of things, one, you have a choice to make. You can either continue to be a statistic and perpetuate the cycle of, you know, what your family has done before, or you can really make a decision to try and break that cycle, to really try and do more, to try and fight for the people. I think that's why I was so driven towards service. I think that was why helping others has always been something that was a really fundamental part of who I am and what makes me who I am. And so I think that whether it's military service, whether it was working in the state or the, the agencies, whether it was uh, building my business, which was there to serve our first responders and our military, or even now serving as a member of Congress, it's just about public service and continuing that servant leadership. Do you remember when you made that conscious decision and was there someone or something that sparked it? You know, when I was in high school, playing sports was really a big part. Being a part of a team really mattered, having that camaraderie. And so when I was 16 years old, I had already made the decision that I was going to go serve in our military. One, I didn't want to shoulder, you know, have my grandparents shoulder the burden of, you know, the cost on college and, you know, continuing to have to struggle through. You know, my grandfather is a welder. My grandmother, she did hair on the weekends, was a stay-at-home mom for, you know, the, the ladies in the community. And so I just felt that I'd been really blessed and it was my time to actually pay it back and to actually give back to the community and give back to the nation. Tell us about your military service. So was honored to serve in the United States Army. Uh, I'm a U.S. Army combat veteran, had served in the 82nd, uh, worked a little bit in their infantry units as well as for their scout recon units and was lucky to be blessed and attached to JSOC, CJTF-20, whenever we went to Iraq. Uh, between my military and government service, I've got over seven years in Iraq. I've got almost three years in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, Pakistan. I've been to Somalia and the Puntland areas as well as for uh, even in Ukraine at certain times, uh, was blown up twice by roadside bombs in 2006 and am honored to be a Bronze Star recipient. JSOC, for those that don't know. Uh, Joint Special Operations Command. And what does that mean? What were your responsibilities? So my primary responsibility was actually as a combat team medic. And I was lucky enough to be able to cross train and then just work directly with the teams. It was always one of those things where, you know, you're really out for the mission first. And then that medical background and that experience is really to try and sustain, but only after you've actually mitigated the threats and firefight and achieved the mission. What was the impact of those explosive incidents? I mean, with the incidents, obviously, I mean, it's one of those things that it takes you back for a moment. But it was really about just kind of the muscle memory, the fundamental training that you get. You react without even having to think at that stage. And that's a credit to, you know, the tremendous uh, training and, and, and preparation that our United States Armed Forces get to experience. And so um, it was a great experience, even though it sounds like it's terrible. It really shows you how prepared and how trained you really are. And I think that was a great, you know, understanding of, okay, I am ready. I am supposed to be here. You know, we had three out of the five guys in one of our vehicles that had gotten severely injured. And being able to sustain those and prevent loss of life was really an important thing. And again, a chance to be a part of that team. What was the training that kicked in in one of those incidents? Describe it. Well, I think that, you know, when you're going through trainings, and we do a lot of trainings, whether it is um, react to chaos drills or, you know, react to contact or uh, how we actually incur on an ambush or our, our combat medical training the, for the individual infantrymen, it's their CLS, their combat lifesaver skills. Um, you know, these are all things that immediately kick in, but also identifying and mitigating the threats. 
you know, making sure that we actually take control of the situation when you're in an ambush, because fire superiority is really the ultimate thing that you have to gain. And so, you know, all of these different trainings that culminate over years and years of service, you know, when that comes into effect, and you actually see how it saves lives, that's really a credit to all those before us who develop these types of curriculums. How do you think that's prepared you for Congress? Well, I think that I'm less prepared for Congress than I was for combat, but I would have to say I felt a lot more comfortable probably overseas than I did in here. Why? Um, well, you know, you're always, <clears throat> at least overseas, you kind of have an idea of who your enemy is, right? And who's actually trying to sharpshoot and go after you. Um, I joke around with people all the time and I say, I don't know if I should have worn my body armor more, uh, you know, here in Congress or more overseas. Uh, and it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek military type of uh, 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 banter back and forth with all of my military brothers here. But, you know, Congress is one of those areas that if you understand public service, if you understand what that oath truly meant, for a lot of us, we did do our formality where we swore our oath on office. But that oath that we took in uniform never expires. You know, just because you take that uniform off doesn't mean that you don't stop fighting for our constitutionality. It doesn't mean that you don't believe in our freedoms, our rights. You know, America is a very unique country where even a child who is born into a certain socioeconomic class, that doesn't define them. You know, we're equal opportunity, not equal outcome. And I think that it's really key that if I could be even a, a example for one child who grew up in a very similar background to what I have, and they see that hard work and opportunity and the ability to continue to serve is something that they want to do and they can do it, you're not limited just by where you grew up. You had a campaign ad where you compared Democrats to Taliban, Al-Qaeda. Do you view Democrats as the enemy? Well, it was more of a reference of mandatory, you know, masking or mandatory things. It's not necessarily, it's basically just trying to say where you have tyrannical and overreach by federal governments or by leadership. You know, for me, the biggest thing is, is that we're supposed to be a nation of freedoms, of rights, of liberties, and that includes medical rights as well. So for me, it was really just trying to explain the fact that one, there's far too much federal government overreach. We too often go into the state and individual rights and violations of our 10th Amendment. And I think that we need to actually, if we truly believe in physical conservatism, if we truly believe in our Constitution, if we truly believe in limited federal government, then we should be striving more for that than taking away the rights and liberties of Americans. When, would, when did you visit Ukraine? So I visited Ukraine uh, in 2015. And so I went over there and helped with just advising and training. You know, not in a government or military, but trying to actually help the people. I mean, these are people who were selling their businesses. Some of them were car salesmen. Some of them were farmers. These are people who had no military experience whatsoever, but they believed in protecting their nation, and protecting their families. And what we saw in Crimea, what we saw in Donetsk, what we were seeing in Luhansk, these are all things that had atrocious. And back then, they were called red separatists, even though they were the Russian military. You know, back then I tried to explain the fact, and I've written many articles, but I tried to talk about the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, the fact that that had been violated, the fact that the Federation of Russia, the United States, the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, and Ukraine had all signed this recognizing Ukraine's independent sovereignty, and that was being violated. So I think that the government should have taken a bigger stance in explaining what this international violation was, and we wouldn't have potentially been where we're at now. Can you explain the tie between you being a constitutionalist and your military service? Well, I think that everything about our military service is based on the protection and defense against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it's really about protecting our inalienable rights. You know, our constitution, our founding fathers really created this so that our God-given rights could not be trampled by tyrannical rule. We didn't want to see what we saw under the rule of England and the rule of the king. And so, you know, when I talk about my military service or what I'm doing right now, what I'm wearing right now is just another extension of my original uniform. And it's still continuing to serve our nation and serve our people.